And I'm excited as well that Pastor Daniel Guy will be bringing God's Word to us today. He shared with us a few weeks ago that he and his wife Esther Guy, also a credentialed minister, they will be leaving at the end of this year to each take full-time campus ministry roles at Princeton University. We're very grateful for them. Open your heart to God's Word today and let's welcome Pastor Daniel. Hey, thank you, Pastor Jim, where, wherever you might be. Um, actually, I think you might be joining us online, and so welcome to our Turkey team. Uh, we're praying for you guys, and welcome to all of the Central family that joins us online today and, and week after week. Uh, it's always a joy to get to uh, meet with you, speak with you, pray with you. So thank you for, for choosing to be a part of the Central Family. And, and good morning to all of you here in the building. Uh, it's an honor to, to be with you today. Um, I, I do spend a lot of my Sundays ministering to the online service. And so, um, yes, I, I do exist. I'm still here. Uh, all of that, it, it happens. Um, but it's, it's great to see you in person. Uh, as we're getting started today, I also just want to recognize my lovely wife, Esther. Uh, yes. As um, Pastor Jim mentioned, we, we do the college and young adult ministries here, and uh, Esther is a, a vital partner with me in that, working with me to disciple uh, students and, and young adults and all the work that we do at Drury's campus. Uh, I can't do it without you. I can't remember to eat without you. So thank you for keeping me alive and in all the ways that you do that. Uh, it's a joy to partner with you in life and ministry, and I love you. So uh, thank you for your support. Um, if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you today, uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 3. I, I'm, I'm going to read from there in just a few minutes. And today we're, we're going to explore a concept that has become the core of the, the college and young adult ministry here at Central. It's become one of the defining, shaping uh, mantras that, that we have for how we go about ministry and, and reaching college students and young adults. And our students that are here, they've probably heard me say uh, more times than, than they care to count that our goal in our ministry is to make lifelong disciples of Jesus. All our teaching, all our mentoring, uh, all our study and prayer, all of our, our gatherings and, and special events, they're driven by this goal. But this isn't a topic just for college students. In fact, that, that's what the name implies, that this is meant to be all of life. It's, it's meant to be a journey that we are on in every stage, every phase of life, every aspect and dimension of our lives. As we sang earlier, Jesus changes everything. And being a disciple of Jesus is not just something that we compartmentalize or that we just do in different phases of life and then leave it behind. It's a lifelong journey. It's supposed to continue on beyond youth camp and, and beyond college chapel services and beyond grad school small groups and, and, and on and on. It, it's, it's something that is meant to be for life. So this morning, we're going to change the initial verb from making lifelong disciples of Jesus to being lifelong disciples of Jesus. So let's explore what that means together this morning. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ways that you meet us, the ways that you've already met us here this morning, the instructions that you've given us, the prayers that you have heard that we've lifted up, the ways that, Lord, we have been able, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be the body of Christ with one another, to encourage each other and build up each other with the gifts that you have given us, with the fruit that you have made grow within us, Lord. And God, we are so grateful for your faithfulness and that you are here with us. And Lord, I just pray that as we hear from your word today, as we explore this concept of being your disciples, being your disciples for life, help us 
to find ways, Lord, that, that we need to come to you, that we need to surrender parts of ourselves that we've held back to you, Lord, in ways that we can endeavor to abide with you. And help me as I speak to make your word clear, to make your heart evident uh, for everyone here to encounter you in precisely the way that you know we need. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what does it mean to be a lifelong disciple of Jesus? I think when many of us hear the word disciple, there, there are two things that come to mind. Um, one is the 12 disciples. Um, it, it's right there, right? Uh, and, and the other one is the Great Commission. And for some of us, it, it might be both of these that, that immediately come to mind. And, and, and that makes sense. I mean, the, the 12 disciples, uh, you know, they were also called the 12 apostles. But, like, that's literally what they were famous for being disciples. That's their brand. Like, of course, we're going to think of these guys, and that makes sense. And the Great Commission, the, the, the last words that Jesus gave to his disciples, uh, we find them in the last three verses in, in the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, where he says to, to, to his disciples that they are to go into all the world and to make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. So when, when people believed in their message about Jesus and the good news that, that Jesus is king and that he is resurrected, that, that that was to be something that initiated those new people into a, a life with Jesus. They were to become disciples themselves. And as they would teach those new disciples all the things that Jesus had commanded, that includes the Great Commission. And that's why it continues on to us still today. The, the Great Commission does apply to us. We still have that mission to make disciples. But I would say that before we emphasize making disciples, before we can do that well, we have to learn how to be disciples. We can't replicate in others what we don't already have in ourselves. It doesn't work that way. And that's what I fear sometimes happens is when we, we hear the word disciple, our minds jump directly to the Great Commission. But I want us to look several chapters earlier, the third chapter of Mark in verses 13 and 14 where it says that Jesus went up on a mountainside and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12, those 12 disciples that we mentioned earlier, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And it goes on to say that they would have authority to cast out demons. And then Mark lists all of those 12 disciples, names, who they are. But there's something crucial in this passage that we need to see. That before Jesus sends his disciples out, he invites them to be with him. That is the first call. That is the, the, the first command that he gives. So being a disciple of Jesus, it begins by being with Jesus. And this makes sense, right? But we live in, in such a productivity-driven culture that we want to focus straight on the doing. We want to jump past the being and go directly to the end, to the Great Commission, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where we can focus on what we think we're supposed to be doing, because doing produces results. When we're doing, we're, we're moving things forward, we're making things happen, we're being effective and efficient, and, and all of these great buzzwords, and there's, there's nothing wrong with, with doing, but we have to make sure that we don't get ahead of where Jesus wants us. And his first command is not go and tell. His first command is an invitation to come and see. In John chapter 1, the very beginning of his gospel, at, at verse 38, it tells about two men that started following Jesus. And they came to him and said, uh, uh, Jesus asked them, what do you want? And they said, where are you staying? 
And Jesus said, come and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. So it wasn't just a one-time chance encounter with Jesus along the road where they heard him say a few things or teach a few things and then they wrote it down and and went along on their way. They remained with him. They received that invitation that he gave and they stayed with him throughout that day so that they could learn from him, that they could learn not just the words that he said, but see who he really is, begin to see his nature and and begin to find ways that they could become more like him. But that can only happen if we follow that first invitation, that first command to be with Jesus. And for disciples being with Jesus, that became a way of life. This was an invitation that's repeated over and over again throughout the Gospels. We've seen it in the first chapter of John. We've seen it already in the third chapter of Mark. Luke chapter 6 echoes that same story of Jesus calling the 12 that they might be with him before they are sent out to carry his mission. It's a continuous way of life that persists over time. And this is what we mean when we say that we have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, Many of us have used that phrase, or I'm sure we've heard it. Uh, People say, yes, I have a relationship with Jesus, or the the emphasis, it's a relationship, not a religion. And and we we know the heart there, um, that, that we're saying that it's not just words we recite. It's not just practices that we go through. We actually know Jesus. And this is what we're talking about, being with him, getting to know him. And that's something that begins in that moment when we experience salvation. And that word salvation, there's a lot that's packed into that word. Uh, It's when we, we put our trust in Jesus. It's when we put our trust in him to do the things that he promised he would do. To forgive us of our sins, to rescue us from a life that is separated from God and that, that is filled with, with sin and with fear. That, that we receive that forgiveness that he promised, the new life that he gives us, a, a new kind of life. There's a lot that's packed into that word. And one of the things it also means is the moment we begin a relationship with Jesus that we enter in and respond to that invitation that he says to come, follow me. Come and see who I am and what I'm about. He invites us to do that. He calls us to know him, to learn about him, to learn from him, and to walk in his ways. So yes, there there are things that Jesus teaches us to do, but our doing must follow our being. We don't begin by doing. We begin by simply being with Jesus. Because there's a change that that has to happen in us, and and it takes time for that change to work its way into our hearts. Um, Eugene Peterson He's written a whole lot of powerful books and and, and memoirs that that inspire pastors all over the world. And he wrote a fantastic book on being a disciple. And I love this title, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Isn't that great? I mean, that is what being a disciple is. It's, It's staying obedient and walking in that line, following after Jesus. Now, he wrote this book in 1980, and it's still a a classic uh, among uh, Christians and and pastors and ministers. And in this book, he identifies an aspect of our American culture that, that he says this is harmful to Christians. It's the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume that if something can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. And that last line makes me laugh so much because, of course, this was written in 1980. 30 seconds for a commercial? That's insane. 
I get frustrated when I have like a five second ad on the YouTube video I'm trying to watch. I'm like, no, come on, I'm trying to learn how to tie a tie. You know, I don't have five seconds to waste on hearing about your nutritional supplements. And uh, that, that's how much more have our attention spans become conditioned to that instant expectation, that kind of I need it and I need it now. If it's worthwhile, I should be able to have it immediately. See, I don't like it when things take time. But time is exactly what Jesus is calling me to give him. He's inviting all of us to spend time with him. And, and when we do, when we're being with Jesus, we begin to see that, that being with him leads to becoming shaped by Jesus. See, I already mentioned that the doing follows the being because there's, there's, there's change that needs to happen in our hearts. And becoming shaped by Jesus, that's the work that he does to make us into the people that he wants us to be. And we see this in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, starting in verse 18, it says that, that Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, uh, Simon and Peter, and his, or Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said this famous line, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And it says that at once they left their nets and, and followed him. But we see that the one doing the making, the one doing the shaping, is Jesus. Come, there's that invitation again. Follow me, and I will make you. See, disciples of Jesus spend time with him, and as we do, we start becoming more like him. He is the one who shapes us into who he desires for us to be, into who he created us to be. With all of our gifts and talents, with all of our interests, with all of our uniqueness, with all of our quirks, that Jesus has something in mind for each one of us. And as we spend that time with him, he shapes us into whatever that is. This isn't something that we do to ourselves or that we do for ourselves. Uh, the emphasis here we, we need to see this. It's not a bunch of to-dos. Jesus doesn't give us a checklist and says, once you've crossed off all of these items, then boom, you're a disciple. You know, He, he doesn't give us like a, a scavenger hunt list and we go around and take pictures of everything. And once we've found all the stuff that Jesus has hidden, uh, then it's like the reward is you're a disciple. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not a focus on doing things. It's a focus on being with him so that he can do the work that we need done. And I find that so reassuring because it is a God-sized job to make a person and to shape a destiny. I'm so grateful that I don't have to carry that burden on my shoulders. But that's the, that's the job that God reserves for himself. But that doesn't mean that I don't do anything at all. That doesn't mean that I just sit there and do nothing. Everything that Jesus does in my life, it is a gift of grace. It's, it is done because Jesus loves me. And there's nothing that I can do to earn it or deserve it or to, to, to make him love me more. There's no earning those gifts of grace. But I will say this, that being with Jesus and being shaped by him, it does take effort. It's not earning. And that can be an attitude of entitlement. But there is effort involved. I have to plan and set aside time to spend with Jesus. And as many in this room can attest, the older you get, the less free that that time shows up on your calendar. You have to do the work to make sure it's going to be there. I, I have to open my Bible and actually read it. To, to, to read the things that Jesus has said and get to know who he is. I have to focus my heart and mind on him in prayer. I, I have to actually pray the words. There's effort that is involved on my end. And these practices, they don't just happen by accident. 
Time with Jesus doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Esther and I uh, had, uh, this summer, we, we, we celebrated our 20th anniversary, and uh, it, was, it was pretty awesome. Uh, we, uh, we got to um, take a, a special sort of once-in-a-lifetime trip uh, where we went to London because uh, we had never been to Europe before, and we wanted to go somewhere that we didn't have to learn a new language uh, because... I mean, I'm talking about time. Nobody has time for that. Uh, so we, we, we scheduled this trip to London. But we didn't just wake up one day and find ourselves in London. You know, we wanted to spend special time with one another. And it required effort. We, we had to start planning years ago and setting aside money to, uh, to, to be able to take this trip. We, we had to plan out our itinerary, have the tickets for all the things that we wanted to do, not so that we could cram in everything that you could possibly see in London within a week, but so that we would have the freedom, the lack of anxiety. We had structured time so that we could enjoy our time, being free with one another, creating memories, things that are going to shape us and impact us for the rest of our lives. And over 20 years, I've also learned that you, I, I can't just spend time with, with Esther on our anniversary. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Every day, every week, every month, we set aside designated time to say we are going to be undistracted, uninterrupted with one another because we love each other. There's effort that goes into spending time with those we love. There is definitely effort that goes into making time to be with Jesus. We have to put forth that effort now, the effort doesn't make us grow. As Pastor Jim has been talking about with the fruit of the Spirit, you know, we can't just will ourselves to, to, to make these things grow in our lives. That's not how fruit works. Uh, you know, a, a tree doesn't just force, you know, peaches to, to, to show up. There's, there's growth that takes time. There's that word again. It, it, it causes uh, what's on the inside to begin to grow and become visible on the outside. So our effort doesn't make us grow, but we do have to be intentional about being with him so that he can make us grow. Our effort isn't what does it. Jesus makes us grow. And when that happens... We become more like him. We begin bearing the fruit of the spirit that we're hearing about and that Pastor Jim will pick up that series next week. So before we can make disciples, we have to be disciples. Jesus makes us his disciples. He shapes us and changes us on the inside so that then all of the doing that does follow, there are things that he asks us to do, but all the doing flows out of our being, who he has made us, who he has shaped us into through and through, all the way to the core of our being. And the way this happens often looks different and the different stages of life. That's where the lifelong part comes in. Being lifelong disciples of Jesus. Now it begins by being with him, and being with him means that we go where he goes. We follow where he leads. And wherever that is, whatever that looks like, being a lifelong disciple of Jesus means that we stay close to Jesus. We stay close by. Now, this is a little different than the being with Jesus, that first invitation where he calls us to himself. Because staying close to him, this is what we do when we're going out. When he does send us to be in that work that he's called us to, when we find ourselves fulfilling and working towards the great commission in our lives, we don't leave Jesus behind. We stay near him. That means that we're going to the places that he goes. We're going to the people that he sends us to. 
We must keep close to him. So now let's return to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. So as we go out into the world and into our communities, into our careers, we're disciples and we're equipped to follow Jesus' command to make more disciples. But at the end of verse 20, the very last part of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives us this reassurance where after he gives the Great Commission, he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Everywhere, always, Jesus will be with us. And the challenge of being a lifelong disciple then is whether we are going to stay close to him. He's not going to abandon us, but if he's leading in one direction and we choose to go elsewhere, or if we neglect to continue drawing close to him, to continue spending that time with him, to continue putting that time aside so that we can be with him and be shaped by him, we may very well find ourselves drifting apart from him. Staying close to Jesus is also called remaining in him or abiding with him. Talking about the fruit of the Spirit, it's, this is the thing that Jesus says in John 15, that if we want to bear fruit, we must abide with him. He is the branch. He is the source of all our life. And if we're connected with him, that fruit is going to appear. So we need to stay close to him and, and continue abiding with him. And that's why we focus in the college ministry on learning how to follow Jesus in ways that, that are independent of, of programs and special events. Now, those are great. I'm not, I'm not bashing any kinds of conferences or concerts. All of these ways where we can meet Jesus and encounter him for the first time, where we can learn and grow and, and knowing who he is and what he is like, these are all powerful, powerful ways that, that can help us grow in our spiritual lives. But, there's always a but. For some reason, really good things can become really bad if we make them ultimate things. That's, that's how idolatry works. We take things that are actually good, but we raise them to a level that they were never meant to be at. Sometimes the programs, the events, the structures, the conferences and concerts, they become a barrier to learning how to actually stay close to Jesus. When that happens, a person starts to think that the only way they can encounter Jesus or serve Jesus or grow spiritually with Jesus is if they have that exact formula in place. They have to go to camps. They, they have to do uh, the, 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 the conferences. They have to have the, the, the right worship set. And as they grow through their lives, um, th those things don't always continue, you know? Uh, not many of us that are in our 40s get to go to youth camp. <laughs> for those who do, we pray for you. <laughs> you guys are doing the Lord's work. And we love you for it because you're investing in, in the lives of our young people and, and uh, helping them see what it looks like to continue following Jesus. But if the only way that we know how to have a spiritual encounter is on a campground, things are going to get rocky after we leave high school, after we graduate college, once we enter into our careers and start raising our families. So when there's a major life transition, like going to, from high school to college or graduating college and starting a career, people that are locked into those models can, can, can begin to feel spiritually detached. We've heard people say that they could be Christian in school, but they don't know how to do it after they graduate because the support of Christian friends is no longer around them 24-7 or they no longer have the structure in place that's keeping them accountable for following and living with Jesus. They don't know how to experience God anymore. And that breaks my heart because I know, we know that God is so much bigger than that. 
Jesus is bigger than these boxes that we can unintentionally put him inside. As we grow and and life gets bigger and more complex, if we learn to abide with Jesus, as we begin to see that his gospel impacts everything, that Jesus changes everything, then we can truly see how great Jesus really is. And it makes me think of one of my favorite pieces of dialogue from the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, you know there's going to be a C.S. Lewis quote uh, in the sermon. That's, yeah, it's obligatory. Um, and so in the Chronicles of Narnia, in the book Prince Caspian, Lucy has returned to Narnia. And this is uh, when she first has a reunion with Aslan. And spoiler alert, if you don't want to hear it, cover your ears, Okay. Aslan represents Jesus. Okay, sorry. I had to put that out there. It's the only way it makes sense. So Lucy reunites with Aslan, and she makes this observation. She says, Aslan, you're bigger. Aslan, you're bigger. Well, that is because you are older, little one, he answered. Not because you are, asked Lucy, I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. May it be for us that every year we grow, we find Jesus bigger. We find new ways that he is impacting our lives, ways that he is working, that he is changing everything, even the new experiences and the new encounters that we are entering into. May we all continue to grow in Christ and find ourselves in awe over and over again that Jesus is so much bigger than we ever thought or imagined. Let that be one of the many joys of being lifelong disciples. And while being a disciple begins with our being, as we grow as disciples, it pours out into all of our doing, all that we set our hands to. When we enter the real world, when we start our careers and families, those are also parts of being a disciple. Sometimes people talk about having a calling and and and. I don't know, some people here may think of that term as like only applying to, you know, uh, full-time ministry, like being a pastor or being uh, a missionary. And so instead of calling, maybe we can use the word vocation. We, We know that word, right? Okay, someone's nodding, so yes. Um, we, we know that word. Um, so vocation, as we talk about what we do and how God has made us and the things that he has brought us to, to, to do with our work, with our skills and talents, By the way, did you know that the word vocation comes from the Latin word calling? (laughs) So it is something that God calls us to, that he has prepared for us. And being a lifelong disciple of Jesus, it means it looks like honoring him in all the work that we do. Colossians 3.17 puts it this way, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So students, high school, college, grad school, uh, even middle schoolers who snuck in, um, I I just want to encourage you in this. As you're looking ahead to what, uh, what your vocation is, what your career is going to be, your future vocation, prepare and plan and dream, but don't neglect your current vocation, to be students. Be good students. That's what God's called you to in this moment. Um, Esther likes to use this phrase called walking in daily wild obedience and being able to, to follow wherever it is that Jesus leads. And sometimes daily wild obedience means going on that missions trip Sometimes it means having that, that, that spiritual conversation with the people in your dorm or, or sitting next to somebody that you've never talked to before and beginning to show them the love of Jesus. Sometimes it means getting to class on time, 
doing your homework. (laughs) Sometimes it's not the glamorous thing, but it's the daily faithfulness and doing it with the right heart. Former students, whether that was a year ago or sometime last century, (laughs) that works. It didn't work a while ago. (laughs) Your vocation, your career, your calling to your family, all of this is part of being disciples of Jesus. We don't outgrow the call to follow him. We don't outgrow the invitation to be with him and to be shaped by him. And even when we can't preach with our words in our workplace, we can honor Christ by bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, letting it be seen and experienced in our work and through our friendships. Because following Jesus is a lifelong adventure. When we look at the end of the Apostle Paul's life, as it was drawing near, he wrote a letter to the Philippian Christians. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, he says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only Let us live up to what we have already attained. At the end of his life, after all the incredible things that the apostle Paul did, he said, I have not obtained it yet. I press on. Just let us live up to what Jesus has already done in us. Let us live worthy of that and let us continue on in it, not casting it aside. Let's see it through to the end. As the worship team Uh, comes back up and we get ready to just spend time in prayer and listening to what the Holy Spirit says. I just want to emphasize that following Jesus is a lifelong commitment. And it doesn't even end at the end of life. In Jesus, we have the promise of resurrection into everlasting life where we will be with him forever. Being lifelong disciples of Jesus doesn't just bring us to heaven when we die, but it's the way that we experience all the fullness of life that Jesus desires for us here and now so that we can be part of what he is doing to make an impact on this world. Being disciples being with him, becoming shaped by him, staying close to him in all of our going and doing and working. And that doesn't mean that we go it alone. We need to be part of community. The fruit of the Spirit, they are practiced in relationship. It's hard to cultivate patience if you don't have an annoying little brother to be patient with. We cultivate those fruit by practicing it with the people around us. That's how Jesus uses the body of Christ to help us all become more like him, to see that fruit grow. But we can't depend on others for that spiritual growth and transformation. We have to be connected with Jesus, even as we are part of community. Each one of us must be connected to the head of the body. We must abide with Jesus so that he makes us and shapes us into who he wants us to be. And when we do that, he'll bring us to the places that he wants us at. He'll send us to the jobs that he has prepared for us and that he has prepared us to do. He'll send us to the people that need to know that Jesus loves them, that we can share that good news with them. That's how, from being disciples, we become those who make disciples.
it begins by just being with him. And so today as we close, we'll open up these altars and our prayer workers are, are, are here to, to pray with you as well. Uh, I'd invite our prayer workers to, to make their way back up to the front. And I would love to ask if there's anyone here who is feeling that they, come on up prayer workers, feeling that commitment, feeling that need to make a commitment to put forth the effort to be with Jesus. And maybe that's new to you. Maybe you, you haven't heard about these practices of being with Jesus, spending time with him. And, and, and today you're like, I, I need this. You know, as the word that was spoken earlier, uh, I, I love the, the, the way that the Holy Spirit spoke uh, through the gift of tongues and interpretation. But one of the things that, that, that God was saying to us is there's so many here who are saying, what else do I need to do? What do I need to do? And God is saying, come be with me. That's where it starts. Just respond to that invitation to be with Jesus. And so if you want to respond to that today, uh, you can come and, and pray in just a moment. I also want to invite those who you have not surrendered your life to being shaped by Jesus. Some of times we go through seasons where we want to keep control. We know what we want to be or to become, and we're going we're gonna to shape ourselves into to, to, to what we think is best. If, if, you, if that's you and you're, you're thinking, I know the Holy Spirit is telling me I need to surrender my life or this part of my life so that Jesus can shape me to be who he wants me to be, I'd invite you to come up and pray as well. And there may be also those here who have spent time with Jesus and have walked with him through the years, but maybe at some point along the way, you just felt that that closeness began to disappear, that drifting detachment began to mark your life. And so if today you want to return to abiding with Jesus, you want to start that practice, that habit in your life again today, we'd invite you to come up to pray or pray in your seats. If you want someone to pray with, you can pray up here. If you just want to pray at the altars, you can do that. So now we're just going to turn to a time of prayer. And if as the worship team leads us, if you would like to come and pray, you're invited to do so. Come on, sing this with me. He's worthy. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Come on, he's the name above every name. Would you stand and sing that with me? Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. I'll sing it. He's holy. We dedicate our life. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love. We sing it again. He's worthy of every song. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. So worthy. You're worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Make that declaration, God, we live for you today. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. The only one will say. Oh, Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Every breath. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We 
this commitment today. God, I build my life on you. Well, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be. Come on, we build we are thankful that Lord, your very first call to us is to just be with you. I want to thank you that you meet us right where we are, whatever we face. Uh, Lord, you're faithful to meet us right where we are and that we can walk with you and that we can abide in you and that we can build our life on you. Lord, as we do that, we thank you that you're faithful to do uh, the hard work in us of shaping us to be more like you. Uh, Lord, so we can carry your message to others that we come in contact. So Lord, as we go out uh, from here today, we just invite you this week to work in each person here in each of us so that you can in turn work through us uh, to minister to the people that we come in contact with. Lord, I just pray that we'd have attentive eyes uh, to the opportunities that you put before us this week, uh, both for ourselves to take a deeper step in you but also to share your love with those that we meet. Thank you that you help us do that. We don't do it alone. We do it together with each other and we do it together with you and we praise you for that today, God. We thank you. Go with us now, we pray. Well, thank you for being at church today. If you'd still yet like prayer, uh, the prayer workers will be here for a moment. You can still come forward. Uh, we invite you as you go this week to go with the grace of the Lord Jesus, 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit before you in all that you do. Bless you.